Oh, thou, my lovely boy, for in thy power dost hold time's fickle glass, his sickle hour, who hast by waning grown, and therein show'st thy lover's withering as thy sweet self grossed. If nature, sovereign mistress over rack, as thou goest onward, still will pluck thee back, she keeps thee to this purpose, that her skill may time disgrace and wretched minutes kill. Yet fear her, O oh, thou minion of her pleasure. She may detain, though not still keep her treasure. Her audit, though delayed, answered must be, and her quietus is to render thee. All right, here we are. This is the very last sonnet Shakespeare ever wrote to the fair youth. It's considered a kind of epilogue to the fair youth sequence. And you might notice that it looks a little bit different than the rest of the sonnets we've encountered so far. I'll get to that. But first, let's figure out what he's saying. Oh thou, oh you, my lovely boy. Now, by lovely boy, is Shakespeare being endearing or is he being condescending? I don't know, honestly, probably both, because with Shakespeare, the answer is usually both. Who in thy power dost hold time's fickle glass. Now, fickle glass could either mean uh, the treachery of looking in a mirror as you get older, or the treachery of an hourglass whose sands always seem to run out no matter what you do. His sickle hour, once again, Shakespeare is equating time with a sickle or a scythe, like the Grim Reaper's scythe, who has to by waning grown. Here he's playing with paradox. So he's saying that as the fair youth's youth has waned or diminished, his beauty has grown. And therein shows thy lover's withering as thy sweet self grossed. So that has put a spotlight on how his lovers are all aging and withering, while he just seems to get younger and more beautiful with time. If nature, sovereign mistress over rack, so if Mother Nature, the, the goddess, the, the mistress of destruction, of rack and ruin, as thou goest onwards, still will pluck thee back. If as you go onwards in life and get older, uh, she keeps pulling you back, keeping you looking young and beautiful, she keeps thee to this purpose. She's only doing it for this reason, that her skill may time disgrace and wretched minutes kill. She's only doing it to pull one over on time, to show off her skills and to uh, delay or obstruct his uh, aging process and his destructive powers. Yet fear her, O oh, thou minion of her pleasure, she may detain, but not still keep her treasure. But don't trust her, because even though she keeps you around because you're her favorite, because you're so darn pretty that she just gets joy out of looking at you, she may detain your beauty. She may hold off the aging process for a while, but she can't keep you young and beautiful forever. Her audit, though delayed, answered must be. Uh, nature owes a debt to time, and she can put it off, but she's going to have to pay it eventually. And her quietus is to render thee. And she's going to pay that debt by handing you over to time. In other words, you're young and beautiful now, but you won't be young and beautiful forever. Now, I'm going to get super uh, analytical and nerdy for a second, but uh, Shakespeare usually writes an iambic pentameter. Uh, and I am is a foot of verse with an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Now, every now and then he throws what's called an anomaly into the verse, and that's where he mixes up the usual pattern of the verse. Um, one such anomaly is called a trochee, and that's a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. Now, Shakespeare only uses one trochee in this sonnet, but he uses it on the word answered. Her audit, though delayed, answered must be. 
he put a trochee on that word because he wants to draw attention to it because that word is kind of the crux of the sonnet. It's the point of the whole thing. He's saying that you're young and beautiful now, but you won't be forever. Nature owes a debt to time and she's going to have to pay it eventually. It will be answered. So I just love, again, it's, it's just pointing out the technique that he's using here. Um, but also, there are these two mysterious empty parentheses at the end of this sonnet. What are they doing there? What does this mean? Now, when I was a young girl, you know, first flipping my way through the sonnets, uh, I saw this and I thought that these were inserted by an editor to explain that uh, there had been a printing error when this sonnet was printed and that uh, for some reason the couplet was left off and that the couplet was lost. That's not the case though, because these parentheses were actually included in the original quarto when the sonnets were first published. Now, unlike many of Shakespeare's plays, the sonnets were actually published during Shakespeare's lifetime. So there's a good chance that these parentheses were put in by Shakespeare, that he actually intended the sonnet to be printed like this. Also, you know, it's not as though it feels like there's a couplet missing. Syntactically, this sonnet feels complete. It makes sense on its own. It doesn't feel like there's a missing couplet. And also, this sonnet does not follow the typical sonnet form. It doesn't follow the typical rhyme pattern of a sonnet. Usually, Shakespeare's sonnets go A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. This sonnet is just made up of couplets. Power, hour, shows, gross, rack, back, etc., etc. So, what's he doing here? Why, why is this so different? Well, first, I think that Shakespeare is playing with the form of this sonnet, the structure of it, uh, to signal that this is the end of the fair youth sequence, to signal that this is the end. But also, uh, now this is a little bit on the nose, but what is this sonnet representing? What's it about? Um, it represents the end of their relationship. It represents the end of the fair youth and Shakespeare as a couple. What better way to represent a missing couple than with a missing couplet? But also, I think that Shakespeare wrote silence into the end of this sonnet. Shakespeare does that sometimes. In his plays, if you ever find a shortened line that isn't shared with another actor, it means either that there's a bit of stage business going on or that it's meant to be a pause, that it's a psychological pause, something's going on in the mind of the character. I think that Shakespeare understood that sometimes silence speaks louder than words. And in this case, we know how much this relationship meant to Shakespeare. We know how absolutely in love with the fair youth he was. And so I think there's just nothing left to say. I think that words have failed him. And so he has purposefully written silence into the end of this sonnet. Just like Hamlet said, the rest is silence. So I think that if you read this sonnet out loud, you should observe that silence because there's a lot in there. Anyway, that's Sonnet 126. That's my theory about it anyway. I'll be back with more tomorrow. Tomorrow we get to start the Dark Lady Sonnets. That's very exciting. Get excited, everybody. All right, that's it for today. All my love, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.